pleasure as our last speaker of the morning to present uh, Cindy Couchman to you. Cindy is um, in her 26th year in education, although I think she's counting all the, the 12 years that she was in K and went to college for that. She's taught mathematics now for 25 years. She just completed her first year as a, an assistant superintendent of learning and instruction in Bueller, Kansas. She walked over to the dark side, but we still invited her uh, anyway. Uh, she's a nationally board certified teacher. She's won numerous awards. I'm not going to go through them all. Just to say that in 2010, our colleagues at K-State gave her their uh, School of Education Alumni Fellow Award. And in 2009, she was a Kansas Teacher of the Year. She's won a number of other awards. Here's what Cindy told us you need to know about her. She's a night owl and really dislikes mornings, specifically getting out of bed. How the hell have you been a teacher for 25 years? I... Don't ask my principal how many times I've been tardy to school. So. Diet Coke is her best friend. She serves over 100 cups of coffee every weekend, but she doesn't drink coffee. Figure that one out. She has a secret addiction to audiobooks. She doesn't like to shop, but does enjoy grocery shopping. Folks, please welcome Cindy Couchman for her presentation, Make It Stick, The Science of Successful Learning. Cindy? Thank you. So I serve 100 cups of coffee every weekend, but I don't drink coffee, so what do I do? Oh, a shelter? That would have been, now I feel like a loser for not being serving at a shelter. I, um, I'm the coffee lady, the church basement lady at our church every Sunday, and it's my job to fix coffee. So I get up um, early on Sundays, which is really a dichotomy since I don't drink coffee and I don't like mornings. Um, so that's a real sacrifice for me. So thank you. Um, talk about the worst time slot. I have to follow Diane Smokorowski and Brad and Randy, and the only thing that's standing between you and lunch is me. <laughs> Not a good place to be, so um, hang in there. Uh, I, I'm excited to share with you Make It Stick. Anybody read the book, Make It Stick? So a few of you out there. So I can't share everything that's in that book because it's immense. So what I'm gonna share is the things that kind of spoke to me, that I thought this is easy change that we can do or things that we've been doing wrong for quite some time. Um, some of you have already done those changes and you're gonna say, well, that's how I've been doing things for years. Well, of course, because you're all excellent educators and you're here learning. I, however, did some things wrong. So um, why this, right? Because our brains are amazing. When I love this quote, our minds don't work the way we think they do. And there's some things in this book that's amazing is it turns out we are not good judges of when we are learning or not which is fascinating when you think that I should know whether I'm learning something. Really, it turns out we don't. Lots of times we think that we're learning and we're not. Um, but we see ourselves in the world as they really are, but we're actually missing a whole lot. So I'm gonna show you just something that, that really emphasizes that. I'm gonna guess that many of you have seen this, which I kinda hope you have. How many of you have seen the video where you have to count the number of passes that the white team is making? Have you seen this video? If you've seen it, you remember it because you, you're gonna, it's one of those that you remember. So, but play along with me if you will. Okay, because there's gonna be some that haven't. Let's see if I, if I click, it'll start here. It's the called the monkey business. Solution. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the ball. Get ready, only white. Don't, don't look at the black team. Okay, so if you would, share with your shoulder partner how many passes the white team made. See if you agree. See how many different answers we get. If you're like me, it was a long time to concentrate and count. It's like, was that 12 or was that 13? Did I, did I just count the right way? How many of you got 14? Good, how many of you got 15? Excellent. How many of you got 16? How many of you got 17? That's an interesting one. Usually we never go over. How many of you got 18? 
It's unusual that, to go over. It's really common to go under. So the correct answer is 16. So super job. Give yourself a high five. Woohoo! Way to go. Woo! You can count to 16. Yes. OK. Celebrate. Um, now if you'd stand up, because you've been sitting for a while. So now stand up just to do something different, because it was a, um, you know, it's been a while since we've stood. If you would, share with somebody beside you or across the table from you, if, or in your little table group. Most of us are sitting in groups of three. If you noticed any other observations, anything else you saw? If you would, have a seat. So it's a little bit of a cheat if you've seen the video before. It's a little bit of a cheat, but that's OK. How many of you noticed the gorilla? OK, how many of you noticed the gorilla that had never seen this video before? OK, you guys are obviously the outstanding people in this room. I mean, because I seriously watched it twice, even after I knew there was a gorilla and went, how did I miss the gorilla that time? OK, so one more. Did anyone notice that a player left the game? Oh, look at you, like six of you. How many of you noticed that that have never seen the video? Seriously, you guys are like should be on the Mensa IQ thing. Did anyone notice the curtain changing color? Oh, no. The curtain changed color. Uh, seriously, you, I, this is amazing. You guys are brilliant people. Let's watch it again. For those of you who are like, that is not, that didn't happen. I don't believe it. And watch it again. Here comes the gorilla, and there goes a player, and the curtain is changing from red to gold. So now there's only two black um, shirted people playing. If looking for a gorilla. If you're looking for something specific, you miss other events. And so that's really, it's a strange thing, the way your brain learns. And sometimes when you think you're learning and you're doing the right thing, you're not. You're, you're doing the wrong thing. You're not very, we're not very good judges of our own learning sometimes. So that's why um, I started th like thinking about this topic. Here's the other reason why, is why this topic clicks. Cindy, why did you become, how many of you have had those students um, and it, that you've worked with them and worked with them and they seem to be studying a lot and yet they just can't remember it. And you're like, how do you do not remember this? We just covered this like two hours ago. You've come back in during seminar. It's five hours later, and you've forgotten already. How is this possible? How is it not committing to long-term learning? And I was fascinated by it because it would seem like I was working with a student, and they got it. I mean, they were having what Diane calls those light bulb moments. You're like, yes. Oh. And then they'd come back the next day, and it was like, 51st dates, like we were starting over again. Like, <laughs> what? You don't remember? I sang, I sat here and sang the quadratic formula, opposite of E, opposite of E, plus you don't remember this? Like we sang, we danced, we had a party, we had five. They're like, uh, no. So I thought, okay, I've got to learn about how the brain works. And this is really the science of how your brain commits things to long-term memory. And it's really interesting information. It's really how do you study? How does an adult learner commit things to long-term memory? How can you come to a conference like this and leave and then still a month later remember it? Because how we do professional learning is not the best way of doing professional learning for long-term memory. Oh, let's go backwards. I had some other things. Um, so we're going to share. I'm going to share you some brief strategies that will help you as a lifelong learner, as a teacher. Um, hopefully your students and your, even your own children. Um, I'm going to have you experience some of the highlights of effective strategies and some common ineffective strategies. And just like our vision that Dr. Watson and Brad um, Nunswander just shared, we choose to do it not because it's easy, but because it's hard. Learning is hard work, and it's not always easy. Okay, also what Dr. Watson just talked about is scouting. So, I'm hoping that you all got a piece of string when you checked in. You might be wondering, why do I have this string? It's time to get the string out. We are going to experience learning. 
You're going to experience some struggle because you know what? It turns out, which most of you already know this, the struggle is real. The struggle is how you commit things to long-term memory. So you're going to struggle, and I want you to feel like you're going to struggle a little bit. There's going to be some of you that already know how this. It turns out, by the way, a shout out to Rain and Marshall, our, our Marshall, our technology people sitting over there. Little round of applause for Rain and Marshall. Nice job. Rain already knows how to do this. I just, I thought no one was going to know how to do. And the first person I asked when I walked in the room, she goes, "Oh yeah, I know how to do that." I was like, "So if you know how to do this, it's great." But I'm hoping a lot of you don't. Um, it is. It turns out easier isn't always better. Easier isn't always better. If do you, does anybody need a string? Because look, Brad. The handy string man will come around and bring you some string. There you go. Thank you, Brad. It's like, he's like Vanna. Vanna. Uh, <laughs> did I just age myself? Um, so we're going to learn how to tie a bowline knot. How many of you already know how to tie a bowline knot? Could stand up and do it right now. Are you the same people that saw the gorilla and all this other stuff? Really, this is not possible. OK, so you're going you're gonna to be geniuses. You can maybe you know, help those around you later. This, by the way, is a shout out to my sons, Clayton and Carter, who are Eagle Scouts, um, because they are bowline knot tying geniuses. So why, why a bowline? So all my research says that you should start with the why. Why am I doing this? OK, here's the why. One is, is I want you to struggle a little bit. I want you to experience some learning. The other reason is, is this is actually a really great lifelong skill. Um, my son has used it twice in an emergency situation that would really save a couple situations. Now, the first time was with our dog. We had thrown, you know, you've been to the lake, you throw stuff out. And the wind had kind of come up. And we didn't realize that the wind had come up so much. And we're throwing stuff out. He's, we have a lab running out into the lake. And he starts swimming back. And the wind is now pushing against him. And you, I don't know if you've ever seen that, but a dog swimming against waves doesn't make much headway very fast. And so I was like, oh my gosh, she's not coming back in. She's not coming back in. She's getting tired. And so Clayton went out and was going to carry him in. But um, I don't know if you've ever tried to get a dog a big lab, but they scratch the heck out of you when they're trying to swim. And so he's like, oh. So he grabbed the rope out of our boat tied a bowline knot around him, and then just kind of pulled him in. And what's great about a bowline knot is it doesn't tighten. So it's safe to pull someone in. You can, um, in the Marines, they have to learn how to tie a bowline knot one-handed. So when they go in and save someone um, into the water, that they can do it one-handed while they're holding on to something else. So it's a very good life skill, a bowline knot. Here's the second time, also at the lake, now that I think about it. So I guess the moral of the story is don't go to the lake with Cindy. Um, it was last summer. I had taken the boat out all by myself, like the first time ever. Big girl moment. <laughs> like I, I was like, I don't know how to back the boat into the lake. Quite humorous. Wish I had it on video. It was like 45 minutes later, the boat was in the water. It was forever. Um, anyway, so I'm, where the, the storm, once again, it starts coming up. We're out at Canopolis, and I'm trying to trailer the boat. And it is like getting ready to hail. The wind is coming in, and it's banging the boat up against our trailer, and it's getting scratched. And I can hear my husband going, what happened? Like, what were you thinking? And so my son is sitting there, and he's trying to get the trailer in, and he's rolling the, the, the um, boat in on the trailer. And the, the attachment to the boat, that rope, breaks. And the wind starts blowing our boat. And I'm like, oh my god, this is a nightmare. How are we going to trailer the boat? We don't have any other rope. The rope has broke. And so he goes out really quick, ties a bowline knot, takes the rope, tie, ties a bowline knot, reels that baby in, trailers the boat just like that. He didn't even think about it. That, I mean, he didn't, even, he didn't hesitate. And I was like, what just happened here? So twice at the lake, there's, there's why. OK, so here we go. There's your directions. So read the directions. That's pretty good. This was right off the internet. That's not my directions. This is the directions from the internet. Form a small loop. That's easy enough, right? Leaving enough rope for the desired loop size. Mm-hmm. That's, that's good. She's got a good start. She's got the small loop. Pass the end 
through the loop as though making an overhand knot. Continue back around the standing end and then back through the small loop. Some of you got a nice start. Some of you made a knot. That's, that's, I mean, it is a bowline knot. The word knot is in there, so you got half of it, right? I would say that right now, there's some parts that are confusing to me. This one right here, form a small loop. I think we all got that. And then it says, pass the end of the rope through the loop as though making an overhand knot. What? Where's that at? Like, when I read that, I went, I don't know how to do that. Okay. So it turns out we need to know whether we're, one of the best ways to learn is kind of through struggling and experimenting it and trying it on your own before I show you how to do it. Completely not the way I taught. The way I taught was here, let me show you how to do it. Now you do it. I do, we do, you do, we have that backwards. You do it. I'll do it. We do it together. But it shouldn't be I do first. And so you got to struggle. You got to think about the loop for a little bit. Your brain is right now committing some things to memory. The small loop. And I have to take an end through another hole? Believe it or not, you're going to remember that. Okay, so stand up if you are, if you totally got it. You can make a bowline knot right now. Stand up. But, 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 um, let, let's assume that you think you've got it. Look, okay, look. So we have some people that we think we know, right? We have three people, like she said. How do I know? Exactly the point. Sometimes we think we know and we don't. Now, there's some cool things that Mary Frazier and I are going to be sharing you. Mary Frazier is this amazing tech person in, in my district. Mary, woohoo, Mary. She and I are going to be sharing with some amazing technology ways of sharing feedback and how to, how to integrate these strategies into techno with technology. Um, one of them is Go Soapbox. So I just did this um, kind of a confusion barometer. Only three people said they got it. But here's where you can get real quick feedback. Your students can come in and go, I'm getting it. I'm confused. I'm getting it. I'm confused. And as a teacher, I see who's got it and who's confused. Right now, my confusion barometer would have about 99% confused. So it's time, to, it's time to intervene because you know what? Here's the next strategy. It turns out struggle is good, but it's got to be productive struggle. It can't be defeating struggle. I can't just keep saying here, keep working, keep working, you're going to get it, keep working. It's got to be productive struggle. So what if I gave you a picture? Ah, now, now, how many of you that thought you got it now are confirmed? I got it, stand up. Does your knot look like that? Maybe, maybe not, right? Okay, so what, so by giving you the picture, could you try it again? So there's the directions. Now you have a picture. See if that helps. Mm -hmm. You got the small loop, right? Everybody gets the small loop. That's the first thing I got. I was like, I got the small loop. Woohoo! It was that darn past the end of the rope through the loop as though making an overhand knot. The darn overhand knot. I didn't know what it meant. And you know what? No matter how many times I read it and I tried it, I still didn't know if I was really right until I looked at the picture and confirmed, no, not right. OK, so remember, easier isn't always better. But maybe it's time to do something different. So more, more productive struggle. I'm going to help you out maybe. Here's my big rope. If you would, take your left hand here, take your right hand here. Your left hand is the rabbit, little bunny rabbit, little bunny foo-foo, hopping through the forest, scooping up the field mice and popping them on the head. OK, you're going to take this now. And here's the key part, is you're going to take this hand, you see how my hand is facing me? And you're going to make a loop with it. So I'm going to show it from this side. So you're here, you're going to take this, and you're going to make a loop right here. So you have a loop right here. Now, there's something that I noticed that I, I felt like my son kind of pointed out that wasn't really great, is it comes over the top. See how the, this part came, comes over the top? 
That's the key to the overhand knot. So this part is on top. The little, little part is on top of the fold. OK, so you're going to take the rabbit. And it says the rabbit goes up through the hole. So you've got to take it up through the hole. And now I'm going to come over here. It does help if I think if you kind of put it on something so you can see it. OK, so here we are. That's great. I'm using the microphone for this. OK, so I've got my, my little loop right here. There's my small loop. Here's my rabbit. So my rabbit's going to go up through the hole. See the hole? I'm going to go up through the hole. Right? And it's going to go around the tree. Now, the tree, I didn't really point out, but the tree, see if you can imagine this. This is the tree, and this is the rabbit hole at the bottom. So this is the tree, this is the rabbit hole, this is your little rabbit. It's, one of the, it's, a, it's a great knot to know. OK, so you got your little, you got your hole. Here's your rabbit. He's going to go up through the hole. And then he's going to go, if I can do it, up through the hole. He's going to go around the back of the tree. And then he's going to go back down in the hole. When you're done, tighten it up. And you should have what they call a bowline knot. Should still struggle a little bit. Most people don't get it the first time. Now, if you notice, the bowline knot doesn't slip, so you can't get it tight. Like, you can't, it won't, like, if you're trying to save somebody, it doesn't, like, cut you in half. Let's try it again. Because it turns out that a little bit of varied practice is pretty good. So, your hand's here. You're going to make a small knot over here. Little loop, sorry, not not. You're going to take your rabbit and you're going to go up underneath the hole. You're going to go up through the hole, right? You're going to go around the back of the tree and then back down the hole. Now, if you're struggling, I'll tell you something. Have somebody put um, your wrist up and do it through a wrist, like have it wrapped around a wrist or wrapped around the back of your chair, like right here. Take it and wrap it around your chair. It's actually easier to do if you're actually doing the loop knot as it's intended. OK, one more time. So yeah, around a cup. Around a cup would be good, around these little top of the chairs. So here we go. So you're going to form your little loop. You're going to go up through the hole. You're going to go around the back of the tree and then back through the hole. And now I've got it tied to this chair that I can't move, but OK. Now, let's see how we're doing at this point. If you think you've got it, stand up. Look it, we've got a few more. Excellent. We're going to come back to it. We're going to come back to it. The around the tree. OK, so the around the tree part, that is kind of confusing. I love that you guys are like, I really do want to learn this now. Like, I'm not letting this go. Here's the key. So where is the tree, right? That's the key. Where is the tree? So if I go up through the hole, the tree is what this part is right here. It's not the rabbit. It's not the part that the, the rabbit is. The tree is over here at the bottom of the base of the hole, and then back through the hole. So it's, it's, the, it's the side that you the tree is basically the, the anchor of what you made your, your original loop first. So you're up here. So the tree is right here. This is the tree. Here is the rabbit hole. This is your tree. So it goes up through the hole, around this tree, and back down. So it's going to go up, around, back down. It's going to go up, and it's going to go around, and then it's going to go back down. And then you have your loop. It is totally easier if you have something to wrap it around, because you can see the tree. Otherwise, you're like too much string in your hands. OK, we're going to come back to it. 
So this is really hard. It turns, it turns out that you're better off when you're struggling with something like this to try it for a while and now put it away. Put it away. And now we're going to go to something else and we're going to come back to it. Okay. Here's another strategy. A strategy that we do a lot, that I always did a lot, is rereading. I gave you a very hard paragraph here. If you would read through that silently to yourself. Can anyone not read it? That's a lot of print. Do you want me to read it out loud? Does anybody, anybody need me to read that out loud? Okay, I'll let you read it to yourself and then... And now, here's a great question. How many of you ever heard of these two individuals? Seriously, oh my gosh. You guys really are a smart group. Okay. I, um, how many of you think you'd even know how to pronounce their names? Excellent. Well, here's how you pronounce them. Sartre, I might be saying that a little bit wrong, and Camus, not Camus. That's how I said it. It's Camus. And um, Sartre. So now, at least we have some sort of name recognition, Sartre and Camus. They're philosophers, right? So, okay, it says these are greatly, they should have um, keenly aware of the absurd. So let's say, I'm going to assume that most of us didn't get the whole gist of that paragraph. Is that a safe assumption? Mm -hmm. Okay, so what if I told you, you know what, reread it. Reread it, because that's what we do a lot. Go back and look at your notes. Reread it. You know what, you need to spend some more time with it. Take your book home. Reread it. Spend some time studying it. Reread it. Not effective at all. In fact, I don't know if you've ever done this because I've done it. I've reread it sometimes and then realized I have no idea what I just read. Like, I don't even, did I read those? Because I'm just going through the rote memory. So here's what another way of learning. Instead of rereading, use elaboration. Elaboration is a technique where you use your own words, you use redefined vocabulary through pictures, um, you use uh, uh, symbols, you use pictures. You reorganize the information. This was made by Mary. It's an infographic. And now look at it. Look at what the information is up here. Here's Sartre. Here's Camus. I'm going to point out some things that she did. Well, maybe you guys could pick out some things. What's one thing that you notice right off the bat? Besides the pictures, what else? The, say it again. Colors. The colors. Sart, oops, Sart is all done, oops, whoop, 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 I went the wrong way. Sart is all done in blue. Look, his blue matches his blue. His red matches his red. What else? Right, shorter sentences, shorter phrases, not so big of words. Redefine, reuse some words. What? Say it again. Oh, they're both smoking, and that is so key. I'm so glad you noticed that. Yes. Okay, not only are they both smoking, but one was an aristocrat-type wealthy philosopher, and one was from the working-class intellectual. Which one do you think was the um, working-class one? The bottom one. Look how he's dressed. He's got a cigarette. What's the other guy got? A pipe. Look how he's dressed. Suddenly, ah, start. He's the... He's the guy up top. He's the wealthy one. Um, he was um, perceived as an Ivy Tower philosopher. Look at how she did the word absurd. She did all of these graphics that, um, of words that mean the same thing as absurd. And look at how fun. Look at silly, this little silly guy right here. Stupid, foolish, illogical. Over here, these are the two philosophers. They studied abs the, the, the study of, of, of what it is to be absurd. And so now, reread it. We're talking about two philosophers, Sartre and Camus. 
At the same time, those, um, they, they've been so keenly aware of the absurd at the same time in our history. Hmm, now it's making sense. Camus, was he the wealthy guy or was he the um, hardworking guy? The hardworking guy. See, all of a sudden, now I can picture him. He's got this cigarette. Always had a strongly lyrical feeling for the material world. His consciousness, I, I, I got to say, it was the sunlight, sea, sex. I was like, I don't know what that means. Maybe he's having sex by the sea and the sunlight. I don't know what that means. But we didn't graphize that. We didn't put that in a graphic. Um, so that his consciousness of the absurd was an intermittent feeling. Also, he came from the working class. So now you can see how this graphic should make more sense. The working class. Keep reading. The entire article pretty much is all about Camus until he gets down here. Sartre, the ferociously dedicated intellectual whose professed aim is to translate everything into words so that formulated truths can react on society. Turns out most of that was on our friend Camus. Camus has more information than Sartre. Now, could you have a conversation about it? I think a little bit better. And in fact, it turns out that this app, um, one of the best ways to tell whether or not you're learning something is frequent quizzing. Tests and assessments get a bad rap sometimes, but it turns out assessment of learning versus for learning is completely different. This would be an assessment for learning. It's super, super important that you know what you know and you know what you don't know. And we don't always know that. Boy, that's a lot of word knows. We don't know when we're learning or not. So do you remember the old flashcards? Did you used to do flashcards? This is old school flashcards. Excellent way of studying, turns out. Because it let you go real quickly, what do I know and what I don't know. Here's the best way to use flashcards. You take your flashcards and you're like, oh, I didn't get that right, I got that one right. I didn't get that one right, I got that one right. I got that one right, I got that one right. And you put them in two different piles of what you knew and what you didn't know. And maybe a third pile of maybe you guessed, but you weren't real sure. You study the what you don't know and what you kind of know a lot, about every day. And then about every third day, you reshuffle them. Don't ever just quit studying what you do know because it'll go away. Reshuffle them and do the sorting again. One of the most simple and most effective ways of studying is that self-quizzing. It's self-quizzing. So how can we as instructors do it? Well, you can use this ghost soapbox, so the confusion barometer that we just did, which uh, Mary and I will share with you in our session. And one of them is, is this real quick quiz. Let's see how we did. Um, I'm going to start this quiz. There's only four questions. Which philosopher was from the working class? Camus. The philosopher, this philosopher had to put away his strong emotional feelings for the material world to consider the philosophically, consider life philosophically. This one's a harder question. Hmm, who had to put their way their emotional feelings? I don't, this one is the one, one of the cards that I would go, I'm not sure I know this one. How do you feel about it? Does anybody feel pretty sure what they know? I'm going to put that on the other side. I kind of, I'm going to guess. We'll just put that one. Both philosophers were students at the university and were serious about their studies. Which one viewed himself as a teacher rather than the student? Sartre. Now, I don't really remember that being in the article, but if you want to know the truth, that sounds a little bit more arrogant. So I'm going, like, that's how I read that, right? So I'm going to start. What is the definition of absurd? Give me a word that you remember from the graphic. One more time. Illogical. Good word. So I'm going to submit that, and it gives you, this is a great quiz, because it tells you what the questions were, lets you review those quizzes, one more, those questions one more time, and I'm done, I'm going to submit my answer, and it tells you right away what you know and what you don't know. Now, I, guess we, I guessed on this last, that one, I got it right, but if I was doing it, I was like, that's one I got to remember. And you can give feedback to your students. So if you notice down here, it says, um, your answer was Camus, and you were correct. And there's some more information. OK. Your answer was Camus and you were correct. Camus had strong emotional feelings to the material world. He had to let them go to, to think about life philosophically. Frequent quizzing is very important. Now, I'm going to give you some tips about that later. But frequent quizzing is very important. It needs to be um, immediate. The kids need to be able to get their immediate feedback so they know what they don't know. 
That's why kids love reviews. You ever given a test without the review? People, like, get, they get all up in arms. I don't know what I don't know. Mass practice. One of the worst things we do our students, and I did it all the time. Mass practice. Mass practice is when you do the same set of things, over, the same skill, over and over and over and over in mass. Math is the most, most biggest violator of that. You would have 15 solve for x, and all 15 questions would be the exact same. And then you'd have another set, set B, usually is what we called it, and they would be 15 questions with the same set of directions, all look the same. And then, so you would do this every section. You do a section, standalone topic, a section, standalone topic, a section, standalone topic. And then you get to the quiz review, and they're like, all mixed together. Mind blown! Like, well, that's not how I did number two, so I don't know how to do number three because I'm used to doing 15 in a row the exact same. They can't figure it out. I remember this bit very specifically with simplifying radicals. How many of you are math teachers in here? How many math teachers? Okay, so I'm going to speak to you five. Um, <laughs> simplifying radicals. Man, they could simplify the heck out of a radical, and then they could add the heck out of radicals, and then they could multiply the heck out of radicals, but you throw them all together, and they don't know the rules. Like when we're multiplying, how do, do we multiply the numbers out in front or those, and then they keep the radical the same or is that an adding? Because they couldn't, they never committed to memory. Mass practice, worst thing we can do. In basketball, you see it in sports all the time. This was always my favorite, the George Mikan drill. How many of you guys did the George Mikan drill over and over? I mean, my neck would be sore from looking up from doing baskets. You know how many times I did this in a game? Zero. Never once did I get a rebound right underneath the basket and then be able to step sideways and do a layup to come right underneath the basket to catch it again and do it again. What? But I spent hours, maybe that's why I sucked at basketball, I don't know, but I spent hours doing the George Mikan drill. Mass practice, not good. So what we should be doing is called interleaving. Interleaving is a new concept for me as far as the, I've never heard that word. There's, two, there's a study that did, um, that was done. Two groups of students were taught how to find the volumes of four solids. One group worked clustered problem type, like find the volume of a cylinder, find the volume of a pyramid. The second group worked the same problems, but they were all mixed together. Cylinder followed by a pyramid, followed by, followed by a prism, followed by um, a sphere. Here are the results. During the practice, the students in group one averaged an 89%. They rocked it compared to only 60% of the ones in group two that were mixing it up. And you know what? This is exactly why teachers and students get frustrated. Because it's easier and I get faster results if I do the mass practice. It's, you're struggling on the other one. And the struggle is hard. But long term memory, the final test, group one scored only 20% correct, whereas group score, two scored 63%. So yes, the short-term gain is great, but you're not going to remember it. We see it over, over in math in the classroom. In fact, by the end of the, uh, the not just a week, but by the end of the unit, the, the interleaved practice boosts learning by more than 215% during, um, over their initial learning. And kids and, and, and teachers too and us as adults quit too soon on it. Because it feels like this is just confusing me. It's just confusing. It's not how I did the last problem. Now it's different. I just want to do the same problem. I tried this with a class, and you know what my class actually did before I explained it to them? They went and found all the circle problems and did all the circles, and then went and found all the cylinder problems and did all the cylinders. They took my interleaving and turned it into mass because it's that much easier. And then I said, OK. I miss the part where I need to explain to you the why of what I'm doing. In basketball, Cal Poly baseball had two groups taking hitting practice. Group one would hit 15 fastballs, followed by 15 curveballs, followed by 15 changeups. Group two had three the same number of pitches, and, um, 45, but they switched up which pitch they were going to get. They didn't know. Group two had markedly better hitting, even though at first they did much worse. They were horrible at the beginning. That isn't that surprising. If you've ever had kids try to hit off of a pitching machine, like you have a kid that can like hit off a pitching machine and rock the heck out of it. And then they go into the game, and they're like swinging at everything that's thrown at them. 
because they've never had to discern whether it's a strike or it's going up above their head or down below because the only thing they've practiced is perfect strikes. And then you're like, why aren't they hitting? They hit so well in practice. Well, because you're not interleaving your practice. So it works in sports, it works in academics. Ah, it's time for a little space practice, shall we? So this is called space practice. This is another technique that it's good to go do something else and then come back to it. So I'm going to try it on the chair again. This is my rabbit. The left hand is my rabbit. I'm going to make a little loop. I'm going to make a loop at the bottom. So remember, the tree is hanging here. There's my tree. Here's my rabbit. So my rabbit's going to go, woo, woo, around the tree. There, there. OK, so here we go. We're going to go up through the hole, up through the hole. We're going to go around the tree and back down the hole. And then tighten it up. It is totally easier if you have something to put it around. How many of you got it this time? Stand up. How about that? Yay! Look at you all. Now, believe it or not, you need to go home and practice this. Even if you didn't get it the first time, you will eventually get it if you know what you're trying to get done. One more time. You ready? For those of you who are like, one more time. I just need it. If I have one more shot at this, I think I'm going to get it. So take it, on, take it on the back of your chair. You're going to make a loop. It's, it would be easier if your string was longer, too. I'm not going to lie. So I make my little my rabbit hole here. This is my tree. This is my rabbit hole. I'm going to go up through the rabbit hole. That's the key. You've got to go up through the hole. Around the back of the tree. Got to go down the back of the tree. And then back down in the hole. Now, that's called spaced practice. You will actually have more people succeed by leaving it for a while and coming back to it. Remember that in your classroom. I, I sometimes would stumble onto this when I would be teaching a concept and I would be worn out from it. Like, I can't teach it anymore. We're just going to move on and I'll come back later. Because if I have to teach the quadratic formula to one more kid, I'm gonna, my head might explode. We'll come back to it. And then I come back to it and the kids are all like, this is so easy. I don't know why I thought it was hard the first time. Space practice. I need to get moving here. Um, so here are some learning tips for students. So what is your takeaway? What's some things that you can go home and tell your students? First of all, practice retrieval memory is really important. Retrieval memory and self-quizzing is the number one and the easiest long-term commit memory that you can imagine. By the way, could you guys say the little thing about the bowline knot right now? Have I said it enough that you would remember? That the rabbit does what? Up through the hole, around the back of the tree, down through the hole. If you wait about two hours and try to say it again, it might not come as fast. But you need to try it. It's the only way that you can remember and commit it to long-term memory. Here is the problem. We do, most of our, uh, we do most of our PD in mass practice. That's how we do PD. That's what we're doing today to you. You're coming in, we're going to dump some stuff on you, you're going to practice it mass, in mass for about an hour, and then you're going to go home. Worst way of learning we can possibly do. However, you can fix that by doing some self-quizzing, putting a reminder on your calendar on your phone, like get your notes out, um, get online to go to Soapbox today and just remember what was on there. You do that just two, they say three times, Three times is the key, and you have to sleep between them. If you sleep in between your learning and your, your space practice, it transfers it into new learn into your brain to long-term memory. So if everybody needs to take a nap now and then wake up and we'll try it again. So space out. You must, um, with a day of the first encounter, sorted flashcards, followed by the shuffled flashcards. That's a great. Um, great way of learning. We're going to show you in 
um, our session about how to do those infographics. We're going to show you about Go Soapbox and how to do some real quick quizzing and feedback and what we call metacognition, how to determine whether or not you're learning. Um, interleave different problem types. Study more than one type at a time. That's really important. In basketball practice, in the book, they talk about a team um, that changed, I think it was a hockey team, that they used to do one-touch passes all the time from the same place on the ice. So the, the hockey player would stand in the same place and they do um, one-touch passes. Well, it turns out, you know, in a game, that you do a one-touch pass from that location on the ice, really never. So they started going up and down the ice and having them doing it on the move. And um, they ended up winning um, the Stanley Cup that year. It was the Blackhawks. It was the year they won it. Um, elaboration and reflection. So elaboration is where, that's the infographic that we talked about, how to reword things, use pictures, um, sketch noting. We're learning sketch noting in our district right now. Um, Mary and Chad are teaching this sketch noting. Sketch noting is amazing. How many of you know how to sketch note? We've, uh, just a handful. It is amazing. It's where, you ever seen those, act, um, those videos that somebody talks and they're drawing really fast with their hand? That's sketch noting. It's how to take notes with pictures. One of the best ways of, because it's converting what you're hearing and words and making connections, new connections. It's called elaboration. The other one is reflection. To share with someone what you learned, something new, um, practice it, talk about what you don't know and what you're confused about, that's the um, confusion barometer. So tips for teachers. Explain to students how learning works. It's my biggest mistake I made. I made all these changes in how I was going to do things, and then I didn't tell the students why we were doing it. You must explain it to the students. It gives them power. Knowledge is power. Um, some kinds of difficulties during learning help actually make it stronger and better retrieved. The struggle is where it commits to long-term memory. It is, the, is where you build those connections in your brain. When your brain has to work harder, it starts firing synapses across that, and it builds a connection. It actually makes it easier to learn more when you struggle. When it's easy, it's often forgotten. When it's easy, it's often forgotten. And you have to experience it. I know Kevin Honeycutt, I had that quote up there. Hearing about learning is like renting information. Then you're going to give it back. If you're just going to hear it, you're just renting the information. You have to give it back at some point. You have to experience it, which is exactly what Diane talked about. You have to experience it. Um, when learning is effortful, it changes the brain. That's what I just talked about. It makes it connections, and it actually increases your intellectual ability. If you've ever struggled with something, it, that's actually making you smarter for other areas. If everything came easy to you, you would never really get, grow. Striving to, I love this quote, striving to surpass your current level of ability often results in setbacks. Yeah, you're going you're, you're gonna to struggle through it. Sometimes... That not time thing, you're like, whew, I still don't get it, and it's starting to hack me off a little bit. Teach students how to study. It's really important. Use frequent quizzing. It needs to be predictable. It needs to be low stake. It does need to count for a grade. They did two different groups of research, and it turns out that if it's low stakes, great, but if there was no stakes, kids didn't try as hard. So very low stakes. But they don't think it should be high. In fact, they suggest that you should never even have to make it up. If you're not in class, you don't make it up. Just a real low stakes. Maybe like, you know, 5% of your overall grade is going to come from these daily five-question five quizzes. You don't make it up when you're gone. It's just real quick feedback. What did you know and what did you not know out of this today's lesson? And then it helps you as the teacher know what you need to come back to. Incorporate elaboration and reflection. That's self-regulated learning. Um, Self-regulated learning is reflecting on your learning. Um, what, do, um, you know, what do you, it's really just metacognition if you want to know the truth. It's setting goals. It's saying how you did on your goals. Um, summarize learning and then make connections and be transparent. I think teachers, you guys, we all do a great job of being, um, building culture in your classroom. But sometimes we just need to say what we're doing and label it. Uh, Mary's always on me a lot of times for doing things and not labeling it and telling what I'm doing. Like, this is the reason I'm doing it. This is the research behind it. And then you, 
Because people will walk away and say, man, I, I thought that was easy. I don't know why, but I kind of got that. Well, they don't know how much work went in behind the scenes. So as an instructor, you need to tell them. The reason I'm using two colors is it will help you organize this is the notes, and over here are the examples. I'm going to use two colors for that. You need to actually tell them why. Be transparent about what everything that you're doing. I used to tell, when I tell a lot of stories when I taught, and when I told stories, I'd always go to one side of the room. And I'd always tell them, when I'm on this side of the story, they'd always, like, as soon as I move over there, they'd all yell, story time! Because that's where I told my stories from. But when I taught, it was over here, like in the middle of the room. And when I, when I had an announcement to make that was really important, I always came over, over by my desk, to my desk. And I was transparent about it. I said, this is where I'm going to use this from. So they knew too. Be transparent about the things that you're doing. So again, why? Why, do we, why am I spending so much time talking about this? Why is it important to me? Because this is so, um, it speaks to my heart. It comes down to the simple but no less profound truth that effortful learning changes the brain, building new connections and capability. This single fact, that our intellectual abilities are not fixed from birth, but are, to be a considerable degree, ours to shape. It's the growth mindset. We make the effort because the effort itself extends the boundaries of our abilities. The more we do, the more we can do. And I don't ever want students to come into my classroom and say, well, I'm not good at math. You, can, you may not think you are right now, but that doesn't mean you won't be tomorrow. You've just got to make effortful learning. Everybody can learn math. Everybody can understand Sartre and Camus. Even Mary and I, we are, heck, Mary was talking about existentialism last night after studying Sartre and Camus with Dana. So everyone can learn. Isn't that the most beautiful thing about education? I mean, that's why we're teachers. We honestly believe that you, with effort, you can learn. And that's the best part, that um, it doesn't dictate your, um, your success. So happy learning. I know that you guys are hungry. Um, I do want to do um, one thing. I'm going to challenge you. Um, I'm going to tell you that if not for the people you meet and the books you read, you'll be the same person in five years that you are today. So I encourage you to meet someone new today, learn something new, and read something new. Most of all, just learn. But the last thing is, oh, and teach someone how to do a bowline knot. You just never know when it might save your dog or your boat from a, a windstorm. And the other thing is don't go to the lake with Cindy because evidently bad things happen. So um, if you need some one-on-one, -on -one, if you want to learn how to do the bow knot, line knot with me, I will teach you. Or You have lots of experts. So thank you. Enjoy your lunch. <laughs>